Hello and welcome to ADP's latest webinar, The Role of HR, Executives Expectations. My name is Karen Brett and I am the Events Manager for ADP. Just before we start, I'd like to explain the interface on your screen. The main window is where the presentation slides will be displayed and you also have a Q&A box on your screen. At the end of the webinar, there will be a Q&A session when you can type any questions you may have in there for our speakers. We'll also be tweeting live throughout and directly following the webinar, so if you would like to join the conversation, you can do so by using the hashtag ADPWebinar, or you can also follow us on at ADP underscore UK. We're delighted to introduce our guest speaker today, Paul Sparrow, who is Professor of International HR Management at Lancaster University Management School and Director of the Centre for Performance-Led HR. Paul is regularly featured in the top 15 of HR Magazine's list of most influential HR thinkers. He's authored, he's authored several books and is regularly sought after for consultation by multinational companies and government agencies. We are also very happy to have Hazel Prevett here today. Hazel is H ADP's HR Director and as well as her experience at ADP, Hazel has worked in a wide range of businesses, both public and private, from very small to large corporates and so she has a deep understanding of the strategic and everyday issues faced by HR professionals. Okay, so let's kick off with a look at how HR has changed over the last 35 years. The profession has become less admin focused and there's a lot of talk these days about the importance of HR within the overall business strategy. Hazel, first of all, what are your thoughts on what's driven this change? Thank you, Karen. Um, yes, um, well, I'm unhappy to say that for most of the 35 years I've been around to see what's going on. So I would say that the key changes that I have witnessed is that over 30 years ago, HR didn't exist. We were looking at a personnel department, very much seen as the paper pushers and potential blockers as far as associates were concerned, how to make life difficult. Um, I think with the Ulrich model, we had an emergence of HR into the environment and we had the business partner approach, which truly allowed HR professionals to get into the business and try to understand how better to support. Personally, I think that today, some of the HR departments have turned into more like a brand image with a one size fits all. And I don't always think that trying to keep up with the best practice and the latest jargon helps HR to create a positive representation to the board. I do agree that there's less admin in terms of paperwork in the department, but I don't think there's less admin requirement. I think the requirements have become more complex. There's a greater expectation and demand for the type of administrative support and data that's needed and consistent, ex consistent extension of legislative re record keeping actually makes life quite difficult. Where the big change has come regarding admin is that technology has come to the fore. Expectation that this will be the panacea is correct, but only if the technology works well. And the expectation in the HR department of an HRIS expert is high. I think the key driver of the changes overall is the shared service provision. If done well, it can free HRBPs to deal with the more strategic issues in the business and really get to grips with partnering the business managers. Done poorly, it isolates associates from HR and HR from the business and delivers perceived poor or less service to managers. It actually points back to the days of record keeping and poor comms where shared service isn't accepted well into the business. And I think that's a shame. There's many different drivers to push towards shared service. And I think that people need to take great care when considering moving over to such a methodology. In many companies, shared service plays the face of HR to the business and is a key factor in defining the perceptions of execs towards the department. Would you agree, Paul? No, I mean, I, I absolutely agree. And I think the, it, it's surprising in a way. If you think of the, the work that we put into the, the HR delivery system and, and the transformations that we've gone through, that we're actually still, we're still doing some of this. And the, 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 the kind of service centre aspect, really important. Uh, you know, we've gone through, I suppose, a lot of important learning. We've, you know, we've tried to understand the importance of the, the reliability of the, of the service providers and their insight into our own business culture. We've had to deal with 
loss of face-to-face -face contact, problems of depersonalization, um, the, the speed of responsiveness, and, uh, and really also the way users actually behave in the way that we might wish they do in terms of service centers. And it's more complex than that, isn't it? I mean, again, if you look at the debates that we've, we've had with almost every aspect of our um, delivery system, so if we, if we take the business partner issue, we've gone through questions about the capability that business partners need. We've looked at that, you know, how, how do we upskill business partners? How do we give them appropriate business acumen? You know, we've had to deal with problems of role drift. How do you, how do you get the best balance between an operational role and a transactional role? And, and, you know, and what's the power that you give to business partners? And how do they interface with the centers of expertise? And similarly, you take the centers of expertise, we've now got to an issue where we've created a lot of um, um, you know, expected areas of um, expertise around sort of talent and organization effectiveness. And yet the problems that we face increasingly are cross-center of expertise. We happen to be much more flexible, um, much more uh, responsive in, in how we we bring together that um, HR expertise and how, it, how we tie it into other, other um, uh, knowledge from outside uh, the HR function. So we've, you know, we've been for a, a pretty rapid journey, and I guess I'd also say that in, at the same time that we've been having to, to, um, to learn how to customize, I think, uh, um, our own HR structure rather than just pursue a model, um, the agenda's changed as well for us. It's as if in a way, we seem to have gone back, I think, 30 years now. If you look at the, the context in which most of our organizations are operating, at the same time in HR that we have to look into the organization, we have to understand the strategy, uh, you know, we have to think about the, the business model and so on, hugely important, and that's never going to go away. But we're being, we're being dragged back almost to questions about work and how it, it, its role in society, because the way people are behaving inside organizations reflects what's happening outside the organization. So uh, HR functions have, have, are having to return to a kind of looking out agenda as well as a looking in agenda. So I think we're going through really quite, uh, quite, quite fundamental uh, times. Okay, well that leads quite nicely into our next slide. Um, talent management tends to be the first task that senior managers cite when asked what they need from HR, with senior managers also saying that they will continue to look to HR for leadership in this area. Paul, what's, your, what's been your experience with this? Absolutely. I mean, I think talent it, it lies at the heart of nearly all the performance challenges. I mean, I think if, if you look at the, the, um, uh, the problems that we're working on inside organizations, it's really now how can you, how can you create innovation throughout the whole of the organization? It's uh, you know, how can we meet customer needs more, more um, um, responsively? Can we create more customer-centric organization designs? How can we actually manage in a, in a, you know, a lean, efficient, um, but intelligent way in terms, of, in terms of managing costs? And how can we globalize delivery? Now, all of those problems are extremely talent-centric. Um, so it's become a very, very important um, agenda for us, I think, um, inside most organizations. And I suppose I'd really say, um, um, as well as being an important issue, the, the problem, of course, that we all know that we face is that <laughs> We in HR have got a role in terms of designing the talent systems, um, but the responsibility for doing talent well lies, of course, um, with the line. It's a line management issue. And I, we have a problem here, I think, because we did a study in the center, and we were talking with talent directors about some of the common challenges that they faced. And most talent directors will actually you know, openly, I think, acknowledge that one of the problems they have is how do you get the attention of the board to these questions um, about talent. And I think there are, there are three challenges um, that we face around talent. I mean, the first is, is really language and jargon. It, you know, in, in HR, you know, we, we, we get fascinated with the detail of high potential and high performance and, and so on. Um, you know, and we talk about emotional intelligence and social capital and all these marvelous things, and they're all really important. But of course, you know, most boards, they really, uh, I think they very quickly get um, confused with some of the, the concepts and the labels that we use in talent management. We really need to simplify, um, I think, a lot of what um, we talk about. And I think the second challenge that we have around talent 
is to do with the, this question of um, um, accountability. I mean, you know, really being very clear who is the, the talent champion inside the organization. I mean, is it the chief executive, the heads of the business divisions, um, you know, what role do executive management committees have? And, of course, we, we have to ask all these questions now. And it's quite, you know, there is, there is a debate. Who should own talent? Some would argue, actually, that maybe it's operations. Who really should have control of talent and not just um, HR? And then that gets you into, I think, the last challenge, really, around talent, which is to do with the scope um, of, of the information that we collect um, about talent. You know, I mean, most... Most boards, for understandable reasons, you know, they only really have line of sight to maybe the top 50 or so managers in the organization. And after that, you know, they want to know that the organization has got good, good uh, talent management systems, but they really, um, you know, they're not into that sort of detail. And uh, so HR has to, has to pick up, I think, you know, the, the, um, um, the more um, functional uh, issues, which is the, you know, what's the actual um, talent bench strength that we have in the organization? You know, what's the link between the organization capabilities that we, you know, we're pursuing in our business model and what that means in terms of the sort of talent that we need and how do we build this in key emerging markets and so on. So we're seeing talent management, um, you know, slowly moving into related activities like workforce planning. Um, you know, and we're seeing the, the boundaries between what we have to do to manage talent effectively um, and also becoming um, you know, much more interlinked. So it's very hard to separate out the question of engagement from the problem of talent. So it's a hugely important agenda. Um, and I think you know, most organizations, uh, even when they were facing relatively stable times, would say talent was a major challenge. And if you look at the current um, um, uncertainty, I suppose, and, uh, and potential for radical change in industrial structures, talent becomes um, um, a massively important question. I absolutely agree, Paul, and, uh, and I think from an operational side, it's worth noting that there are many versions of talent management to suit the size and type of a business. So even businesses that are not large corporate organizations still need to compete in the outside world to gain the skills that they need. Um, and I also absolutely agree that there's a lack of clarity about ownership. And I think sometimes HR failed to try and define that ownership and can end up shouldering an unrealistic expectation um, to be able to deliver everything for the business. If businesses are in a trans transformation stage requiring new talent development, then it's critical that there's an agreement of what talent is needed and what delivery is expected. Because if one area of the business goes off recruiting in a particular way for a particular skill and it doesn't match with what the rest of the business is doing, then even if your line managers are taking responsibility and being quite proactive, the, con the confusion that results doesn't help the business at all. And if we're not careful, it's HR that takes the blame. Um, I think the executive perception um, needs to be set by HR. The system needs to be supported by HR, but there needs to be clear ownership in the business and a clear understanding of where we're trying to take the talent. No, I, I, think, I, think, I think that's right. I think the other thing that, that, that's also um, um, you know, always a, a cause of debate is when we talk about talent management, you know, is this talking about senior managers, you know, the senior leadership of, of the organization, and therefore the talent management is about you know, what we have to do to actually manage um, um, the elites, as it were, inside companies, and of course that's a huge, a huge area of activity. And yet, you know, we also know, um, you know, with lots of um, um, you know, business models being pursued, that uh, that when you, if you're talking about problems of talent, you know, this actually can be middle skills, it can be technical skills, and so on. And um, and, and and there, I think, you know, again, it is very much HR having to work with the line to actually try and understand and to, to kind of bottom out what exactly is the nature of, the, of, these, of these technical skills that may become more mission critical 
um, and you know, and, and therefore, you know, once we actually devise strategies to, to to be able to kind of resource that talent uh, more more reliably in the future, you know, then the issue does go back to to the line in terms of then saying, you know, and of course, uh, you must be able to to retain that talent, and that's why, of course, it's always very difficult to kind of draw the boundaries between what we do under a kind of workforce planning and the talent um, um, umbrella, and what also we have to go and do in terms of um, you know what becomes important for managing talent, and I think one of the other challenges, uh, and I'm sure you know you, you may see this in your own organisation as well, but is that um, you know we're, we're thinking in times of austerity in a way, there's less that we can do um, overtly in terms of managing talent and uh, retaining talent, and careers actually have become very important again. So I think people so again the boundaries between what the talent function does and what we do in our leadership models and what we do from a career management point of view, from a learning and development point of view, are, are actually sort of eroding. So we're seeing some very interesting work, I think, being done inside organizations to join up those problems, to join up those questions. Thanks, Paul. Um, moving on to employee engagement, we all know there's been a huge focus on uh, the importance of this in the past few years. 60% of companies cite employee engagement as a leading priority. Do you think there's a secret here, a formula as such? I think um, um, one of the issues with engagement, you know, again, is, is that uh, it's, it's such an obvious issue, it's such an obvious problem. And I think, you know, we, we have to avoid getting hung up, of course, on uh, you know, exactly what we mean by engagement. Everyone's been through those debates. We've had the McLeod Review in the UK. Um, you know, sort of, uh, looking at these sorts of issues, but it's you know it's very clear, uh, and, and it's in, in most most organisation settings, that uh, you know, engagement is an important predictor of business unit performance. And so the challenge then, I think, to us in HR is to understand exactly what that link is. And I think your question is, you know, I mean, it's it's an important one, which is you use the word formula, and I think. Um, you know, there's a danger in the engagement debate, and there's a danger in HR, which is that we, you know, we often we jump very quickly on some evidence and you know and on some models. So a lot of the work we've done in engagement, you know, it's been driven by um, the service profit chain and you know the view that you treat your employees as consumers of the organisation and as satisfied employees, you know, pr provide better customer service and so on. Now this is you know broadly true. But I think the thing that's, that's, that has happened as, as the engagement uh, debate has matured is that we're seeing, we're seeing much better work, I think, being done inside organizations as, as, as they try and gather their own data, um, you know, understand exactly how employee attitudes shape particular key business metrics, um, and, and then you know, what must be done to measure that. And I'll give you an example. Um, you know, there was some work done in uh, um, McDonald's, and we, we were involved in some of this a few years ago. And McDonald's, of course, were looking at the link between their, their, their employee survey and employee attitudes and business in performance. And there was a very clear um, um, predictive you know, impact that employee attitudes had. And they learned, as they began to analyze the data, exactly you know, which attitudes became important, which attitudes drove customer orientation, which attitudes drove job satisfaction, and how these things then fed into business performance. And that was very useful. But what was also interesting was that the more they got into this, the more they began to, to analyze, to measure, and to understand their business, um, uh, two things happened. The first was that operations actually began to get really interested in this, which is the good news. And the other thing that happened was that they began to realize other things as well as engagement might be equally important. So, for example, you know, you, you might record of some work done, and it was done on age, and it was done on essentially the kind of demographic makeup of their teams. And they came across this fascinating finding, which, which was that if they had one 50-year-old in amongst a team mix, that there could be a 20% uplift in customer service metrics, which is rather rather startling. Now, that wasn't saying older employees were better, but it was saying that the mix, the demographic team mix, can be a very important aspect to measure. So what I think is happening is that you know, if there is a formula, 
um, is that organizations have started to, to ask questions about positive employee attitudes, which you may call engagement. And then they have started to, to show how those, uh, how those attitudes can be linked to some aspects of business performance. They've realized that their recipe is different to every other company. You know, the, the, the service proposition is different. It works in different ways in different sectors. So they've started to unravel that, and then they've been able to join that data up um, with, some other, with some other business metrics. And that, I think, is important. And I guess I'd say one, one other thing um, about what we're seeing. In more and more organizations now, as we start to you know, analyze uh, the engagement data, it's almost as if it, it, it's a return to basics. It's becoming very clear that for most employees, if you think about drivers of engagement, it's really now, it's about trust, it's about fairness, and it's about voice. And if you, do, if you can't solve those three problems, then in a way, you know, uh, there's no point in getting too fancy about some of the things you do around engagement. You have to, you have to deal with those. And I think the other thing that's happening is that um, if we look at the predictors of engagement, and there are many things important in different employee segments, but we know a key ingredient is clearly leadership, which is why everyone is giving so much attention to their leadership models again, because that's a very important um, aspect. So the role of leaders, the ability of leaders to be able to tell a story to your workforce. You know, the, the McLeod Review would call it um, having a, uh, a strategic narrative. But you know, at the end of the day, it's helping make sense of a complex business environment in ways that uh, employees find useful and meaningful and uh, a story that they wish, to, they wish to engage with. So I think we're beginning to see engagement in a much more, a much broader way, and that's, I think, perhaps more sensible to see it as part of that, that uh, process of actually engaging, engaging the workforce with a particular issue. It's, it's the engage with what question that's more important than just thinking about employee engagement in a general sense. Yes, and certainly with reference to the return to basics, I think we need to look externally to society in general, not just look inward to the business need or even across the business sector. Um, I do believe that engagement is now being affected by a more deeper social shift, which if you just look back over the past two years and consider what's happened to people due to the economy, um, we've seen banks acting in a less than ethical manner. We've got government stories that would suggest we're being run by less than ethical people. Um, it's no wonder that, that people want a safety net to feel that we've gone back to those old-fashioned values where people told the truth and could be trusted with something so important as your pension. Um, people can't retire as early as they thought if their pension parts have been significantly reduced. They stay in work. The younger generation may see them as job blockers, but from their point of view, they're turning up at the office every day instead of being in that retirement cottage in France. Children can't leave home if they haven't got a job because they can't afford a home. And older parents are starting to need care. So potentially the sandwich generation are picking up most of the, of the brick bats that the general social situation has thrown at them. So I think we need to take these kinds of things into account when we're looking at the overall engagement and not just focusing on what's the business doing to the people, what's society doing to the people, and how do HR support that? Yeah, I, I, I think that's you're absolutely right, and, 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 and you're raising a really important sort of issue there. And I think, you know, in the, in the engagement movement, people have often said that, you know, in HR, we, we spent a lot of time talking about you know, why engagement is important for business reasons, which is necessary, and it is. It's very important in you know, a predictor of business performance. But, but you're right. You know, for most employees, they also need to understand or you know, be persuaded, well, what's in it for me in one sense? Is engagement good for individuals? The interesting thing, actually, is that there is, I think there's some, really, there's some positive news there. I mean, there's increasing, more and more research basically showing that engagement actually is also um, um, associated with individual well-being. So there's a, there's a benefit for, for, for employees. 
but I think also what you're talking about there is um, it goes back to this question you know that, that we, we raised at the very beginning, which was HR having to look out again um, you know, towards work and society. And I think you're right. You know, we actually face quite fundamental questions now about about fairness, uh, fairness in a sort of general sense. And if you ask, um, you know, we know that one of the problems we have in HR is that things that we may do to benefit one employee segment. Uh, and to be fair to to one employee segment, you know, are being perceived as being extremely unfair by by other groups, by other segments, and we face extremely complex issues. You mentioned pensions, and I think what's interesting is that um, you know, again, it, it, this raises questions about our own toolkits in HR to kind of deal with these issues. And we're doing some work at the moment with, in, in the UK with the with, with the CIPD, where we're looking at this issue of what we'd call the changing contours of fairness. You know, what lenses should we use to try and help navigate our way through these these these, these very complex problems that we face with, with our workforce? And you know, in HR, we're used to we're used to you know um, things like you know procedural justice and industrial relations and and so on and distributive justice. So we have certain ideas. And I think what's interesting now is that we we need to look to different different disciplines, different um, um, models to actually be able to deal with these questions. You know, I mean, there are very big questions about burden sharing. What is fair to one generation, but apparently is very unfair to another generation. If you look at you know, how we manage an older workforce, an aging workforce, what we may do to actually keep older employees engaged and to give them good quality employment, maybe denying entry to younger people to certain um, um, professions. So, you know, I think what's interesting is that we've gone back to the, these really quite fundamental questions, and, and I think you're right. Um, you know, the evidence increasingly, I think, will show us that the, the engagement that we get from our workforce will be influenced by how, how we address these broader these broader questions. If the HR function doesn't do this inside the organisation, then who is going to do it? Thanks, Paul. Um, if we just think about HR technology now for a minute, um, of course, many organisations have embraced HR technology now as crucial to how they work. What do you two see as the main issues here? From an HR practitioner's point of view, um, I just think there is an absolute plethora of data out there, only matched by the number of sources from which the data can flow. And there's a, a really clear expectation from, a, from associates and managers for social input, mobile access, and, and a general data on demand sort of culture. I think from an HR practitioner point of view, we should be looking to ask the question, to what end? Um, I speak from personal experience. HR is drowning in data. I've been reared as, as, a, as a practitioner that needs to measure everything, whether I'm for what I'm measuring it for or not. I think it's absolutely crucial that we identify which data is meaningful and which data is able to support the engagement story to give us predictive um, information towards future trends and where we might need to go and to help plan with the strategy. I think when you put all that picture together, the power that is, is possible is incredible. But we have to remember that technology for technology's sake is pointless. There has to be a value in the end information and at the same time we have a duty of care to protect data so where does big data and HR analytics stop and invasion into someone's privacy and personal data begin and I think HR again has been expected to be the arbiter of this decision and to draw the lines as to acceptable boundaries I think HR can lead, but they definitely need the support and understanding of the exec team to make consistent decisions across the business as to just how big data is going to be used, where the value is going to come from, and how we continue to protect our staff. I think you're raising some really important issues there, and I think... Uh um, you know, and, and just the whole issue about sort of privacy and then the issues about the 
the volume of data um, you know is is, is these these are problems that are, are, we're going to have to deal with in the HR function. And I think I think you're right in a way. You know, I mean, underneath this this, this whole question of technology, there are, I think there are two sides to it. There's one which is how do we use technology in general to to actually you know enable organizations to you know um, um, act more more effectively to decentralize uh, you know decision making capability and all these good things and actually the evidence there is is really not too positive you know i mean generally you know, we seem to be all, we always seem to be tempted to use technology to actually control uh, rather than to empower even though we know it can be used to empower and i think hr has a role here in in helping um Persuade and influence, you know, the, the organisation when it's when it's looking at how it's going to use technical systems um, to use technology constructively. Um, you know, I think we 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 can be a very strong voice in that, um, but we face a major cultural challenge in in, in addressing that problem. And you, you mentioned this this this, this issue of um, you know that we can be drowning in data and information. And I think I think it's absolutely right. And I think one of the certainly in in the work that, we, in the, that we've done when we've looked at this, I mean, it's this whole question of big data. It seems to me that, you know, we actually, we seem to be having to evolve through a series of stages. And uh, you know, the HR function has, has, the first problem it has is that generally we're not really often skilled up to actually do analytics and analysis. We're not really a very quantitative function. Some people are, but most functions, you know, we only have a handful of people who maybe do that. Um, and it's as if, you know, so we start off and we basically start to capture useful data. We've mentioned engagement data. So we start to understand the sorts of data that we need to measure, the sorts of metrics that should be captured, and, and how we may link these things. And then the problem is, you know, having linked data, we, we have to then ask you know, much more difficult questions of, is it really causal, you know, and so on. Then it's as if the next stage we go through is that having, having put the measurement systems in, having got the data, as you say, which, which you might be drowning in, is to then say, well, how can we create insight into this data? How can we see patterns? How can it, it, this be used usefully um, um, to link our work with other, other, other business problems, operational excellence, consumer insight, you know, whatever those problems may be? And then, having done that, you know, I think most analytics functions would then say the next problem they have to solve is, you know, having got some powerful insights, well, how do you actually get the line to use the data? You know, we may have some great insights, and we have got some great, great insights in HR about this performance. So how do you build a culture that listens to this and that actually acts upon the data that we're, that we're creating? Um, and I guess finally, and most people are working on that problem, and I guess finally, the next issue is um, once you start to actually get some traction with this data, um, um, it's, it's then how do you broaden out your data capture in ways that will link technical, operational, consumer, employee measurements together and to use that to actually understand you know, short-term performance and long-term performance. And I think it's one of these other journeys that we're going on. You know, we, we, we've, we've opened up this, um, uh, this new area of activity. Um, and I think you're right, you know, sort of, um, if for many of us, the problem is that we're still just being drowned by the data, and that, that's not doing anyone um, any favours. We have to actually think very carefully, I think, about why we, why we wish to do this um, and uh, what becomes important in doing it. And one last observation, because um, I think you raised a really, I mean, there's a really important problem, isn't there, which is about privacy and about... Um, you know, sort of uh, um, how we use data and what information we have. We, we were doing some work and we were looking at um, L&D functions and we were looking at, um, you know, situations where employees may now self-learn. You know, and there's a lot of activity actually where the learning agenda is created by your customers, you know, and uh, uh, by your consumers and starts to raise important questions for us inside organizations about, um, you know, how we work with our employees and how we work with our, our, our customers and who owns what in terms of uh, um, um, you know, the, the data and the insight that can be, that can be created uh, from that data. I think, I think we're going to have to deal with all these problems. They're really quite ethical issues for us, aren't they? Thanks, Paul. Um, moving on now to uh, legal responsibilities. 
there's been a huge increase in the volume and complexity of employment legislation in the last two decades, and we continually hear it described as a burden by businesses. It's obviously not going away, so um, how does it affect HR? From, from the HR perspective, um, the legal implications and the different levels of complexity in the processes and the laws that the department is expected to keep up with have indeed become burdensome in the terms of the amount, the changes, the short time between changes. Just keeping up with up-to-date legislation can be so time-consuming, and yet it is a piece of subject matter expertise that the HR department cannot afford to fail in. And I think everybody would recognise that HR is there to do the risk assessment, to protect the business, and in some instances to make sure that the duty of care for the individual is covered. But I sometimes think it gets lost a bit in the mist of just how many different aspects we're expected to cope with. I think most people would see, well, there's laws around hiring, firing, there's, there's laws around disciplinary, but what about your long-term sick and care of disabled, uh, flexible working, um, how to manage the, um, the policies that you have in place around the actual care of your people in the business? It, it does get to be a heavy responsibility on HR, and sometimes it can feel like we're expected to be social, welfare, legal, and everything rolled up into one. What I would li really like to see is, is HR take a different tack on the legal aspects. By all means, remain the subject matter expert, but to somehow break free of this yoke of compliance monitor and while still maintaining the lead in, in complex issues, the general role should be one of education and turning the legal elements into sizable chunks that managers can understand and absorb. And the, and the best way through this, I believe, is, is to have a solid policy framework which supports the compliance elements but is also seen to support the strategic goals, the ethos and the culture of the company. So the law doesn't just stand out as an issue. It becomes an intrinsic part of the way you do business. If the law is what we must do, then your policy creation can determine how it gets done. And couching the law in the context of policy clarifies expectation for both managers and associates and helps people to gain confidence in how to manage situations, how to participate in situations. The education of people managers will build the confidence in the way they manage. It will help to engender the sense of trust and fairness mentioned before. Strong legal policy will increase the standard of decision making so that people don't go out and do really stupid things that you have to pretend didn't happen or make it better or pay the price for. But also, it isn't just stopping that expense. It, it's, if that was wrong to do, then potentially that's been wrong for the associate. That will break trust. We have to be seen to show our staff that managers understand the elements of the law and can deal with it in a fair and effective way. I do not believe that execs see or expect this application in their business, but I believe that HR can play a lead in helping the business to understand the law and reducing some of that burden so that it just becomes part of standard behaviour as opposed to a process that you go to when you've been put on the naughty step. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I think that's uh, it's, it's a huge challenge, isn't it, for us? And I think, I, I think what... The challenge is that really is it's almost culture, isn't it? I mean, I mean if you just listen to um, the things you know that you were talking about there, you, you know, this is about this is about trust, you know, this is about sort of fairness, this is about risk, it's about risk management. And I think it's interesting, isn't it, that that um, for me, you know, I, I would look and I'm always very cautious in terms of uh, employment law because I would, as a psychologist, I would I would claim very little insight to the to the you know the complexities of it. But to me. It, it's a problem in terms of value. Um, uh, it's a problem of actually sort of risk management. It's a problem of how we help protect and preserve um, value in organisations. And I think, 
I mean, I, I think you're right that you know that, that, that in a way, part of what you're, you're saying there is is that um, you know, managers, rather than actually almost you know, seeing HR as, as, as some uh, font of all knowledge and the people who tell you you know what you can and what you can't do and how to get you in or out of problems and so on that you might have created, it's almost really just a, a way of, um, as you say, you know, educating people to think about um, uh, the importance of why you have legislation, why you have regulation in in the first place and how to use that positively. And I think many of these questions, you know, that, that we face in terms of law, you know, they are at the end of the day, you know, it's there to actually, you know, uh, protect the corporate reputation. It's there to actually help manage risk and avoid, you know, the, the, the accidents and the, the performance that, that we don't expect, but which can be extremely damaging when it's created. And it's there, as you say, to actually ensure a degree of uh, um, fairness. Uh, you know, in 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 what might be done, and I think what's interesting is is that not only is of course you know, employment law massively complex and, and 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 impacting more and more aspects of our internal management, uh, it's not just the law. I mean, it, it, it's it's a regulatory sort of influence and it's transparency. This whole question of transparency, and I, to me, I actually I group these things together. You know, it's it's all part of this issue of of the internal way in which we work in organizations is becoming much more um, visible, you know, either to the law or to regulators or to employees or consumers in terms of how they judge um, um, how we act. And I think, I think you're right. I think this is basically, it's, it's an education issue. It's a cultural challenge um, um, you know, that we actually have to, to, to make people understand why these issues are going to be important. Thanks, Paul. Um, if you talk to any HR professionals these days, the chances are they'll use the term strategy. Those outside HR talk less around strategy and more about the need to complete specific tasks. If you could both gaze into a crystal ball right now, how do you think you would see this changing in the future? Well, I think for me, um, um, one of the main changes, uh, I think there are two issues really. One is, is, is Thankfully, there is increasing uh, acceptance that that strategy, you know, is not about uh, looking to best practices and, and 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 so on. That you know, that this is very much about the the internal um, um, insight that um, the HR function has got, you know, and uh, and this is really about how we how we tie ourselves into. Uh, understanding, you know, challenges of challenges of a business model, and being able to to argue as as an equal partner, um, you know, what the people and organisation issues will be that you will face if you pursue a particular approach or a particular strategy. In fact, it, you know, it, it's when you talk to strategists about this issue, it's quite interesting. HR professors, HR professors often talk to strategy professors, and strategy professors, you know, they look at you almost kind of bemused in a way when you ask this question about how HR contributes to strategy, because they basically say, you know, strategy is about problems of markets, and it's about problems of actually how the organization executes, um, um, you know, its business model, and the second is, is, is a people-centric issue, you know, so what's the, what's the argument, what's the debate? And I, I think what we will see is um, in those organizations where the HR function has, has been able to demonstrate it, it, its value um, um, in helping guide um, um, you know, organizations in, in terms of how, how, they, how they create important outcomes, then uh, HR you know, will continue to have a rosy future. Um, in those organizations where you know, HR is still seen as, as as looking to its internal structures and, and so on. Um, you know, then actually the future is not so positive. But I think there is there is one other change, and this is this is something that we, we've been picking up in some work, which we're calling sort of beyond the organisation. And it goes back to this, this issue I mentioned of, of, of business model. Um, it's not only do we have to understand our own organisation strategy, but increasingly, I mean, we deliver business now through uh, multiple uh, relationships, complex business models that involve several organizations, uh, public-private sector partnerships. We have you know, supply chain um, integration and so on. And increasingly in HR, we, see, you know, we need, I think, to see ourselves as being responsible not just for our own organization's workforce, but for all the people and organization issues that actually have to be managed across the whole of this, the, the uh, 
the uh, delivery across the, the network of organizations. And, you know, these are questions of, of uh, risk, risk management. You know, think of some of the kind of, you know, think of BP, think of the issue, you know, it was almost, it's almost irrelevant who actually might have been responsible eventually for various things on a particular, in a particular rig or whatever. BP paid the price for what happened across the whole of that sort of, um, uh, that network of organizations. And so, you know, HR, I think, is going to start to um, elevate, be elevated into much more important questions. It's going to, have to, it's going to be involved in questions of, 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 of risk and reputation management. It's going to be involved in questions of governance, how you, how, how you ensure effective governance of the behavior of, your, of the organization and your partners. It's going to be involved in questions of capability, how you build capability in its broadest sense across organizations. And those are very interesting and exciting um, agendas for us to be involved in. So, you know, so, so um, I, I think the, the strategy question is now going to be seen uh, uh, much more broadly. And the only the question really is, um, you know, are those people responsible for leading HR and are the HR functions um, going to be skilled and equipped to deal with these uh, uh, with these broader questions, because they will be working much more closely with the line in solving these questions. I think you make a, a really good point, and that's a really broad way of looking at how HR should be expecting to to interact with the strategy of the business. Um, I do think that in order to be allowed into those conversations, there's a piece of, um, of proving that needs to go on first. And from personal experience, um, I believe the best way to build credibility with your exec team or your line managers is to be able to recognize a problem, take the pain away and deliver a result which is tangible and visible to the business at whatever level you are working. And if each time the business has a, 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 a stumbling block that HR is involved in and HR can be seen to understand why that's a block to the strategy of the business and, and can find a way around it, then more and more we'll be pulled into those broader level conversations. I do think sometimes we're our own worst enemy and maybe we hide behind the HR best practice motto and some of the HR speakers may be been driven by the wish to be taken seriously by the exec team in the first place, which is quite ironic, um, given that all we seem to be able to do is, is bamboozle them with, uh, with various words they don't understand. But I would like to see HRD seen, first of all, as a business manager who happens to specialise in people. Um, that way, the HRD is looking at the business holistically and seeing where HR can add value both operationally and strategically. And it doesn't always fit with the expected best practice approach, but I do believe it's the only way to really get under the skin of the business and to be able to contribute to those broader and high-level expectations. Yeah, no, I, I, I think I think that, that that's that, that's interesting, isn't it? And you know, it, I think it starts to raise questions about, um, in a way, you know, who who are the people and organisation um, experts inside the organisation? And I think uh, something that, that that has struck me in 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 the last few years, you know, when we've been looking at some of these issues like innovation or or uh, a lean management and so on, and you know, there's good and bad news, I think, for HR when you do that. Um, uh, the good news is that all, you know, all the evidence that looks at uh, what you have to do to execute you know, and, to, and to deal with these problems shows how incredibly people and organization-centric they are. Um, the, the slightly more worrying news is that if you look at non-HR work, uh, you know, we, we did, we've just done a report recently, we've been looking at lean management and, and HR and so on. Nearly all the work comes from operations management uh, um, in that particular topic. All the issues they have, they have identified, and they are well aware, you know, of the the people and the leadership questions and and so on, and the engagement questions. It, but it's being done; it, it's it's already being looked at by these other functions, and I think the the um, um, you know, that starts to to create 
I think, a new agenda for HR. I think it is less an agenda where we start to say, well, we are the experts on this. I mean, we are, of course. We, you know, we surely must know more about people and organizations than, than many of the disciplines. But, uh, you know, but we are actually, you know, we're, uh, in, we're working with Lion and with other functions that have also got some interesting insights and some interesting knowledge to, to these issues. And I think we're going to see much more collaborative um, um, relationships that will exist between um, um, uh, HR functions and uh, and the line, you know, we talked about centres of expertise, you know, so early and so on. And I, you know, I often you know say, well, where's your centre of expertise for innovation or you know or for customer centricity and so on, or those sorts of business problems. And I think what will happen is that HR, in a way, probably will need to start to. Um, be less concerned with, you know, defending the boundaries of the empire, uh, in a way, and actually, you know, being much more open to to, to kind of working uh, um, um, in a collaborative way with the other business functions on the various, uh, um, um, you know, project groups and so on. And that creates, for people like yourself in your own role, of course, a you know, massive complexity in the role because you, you know, you're managing your own function, your own business, and you're also going to be managing people who are. Um, working on important people issues, you know, but who may not be owned by HR, uh, and yet we we need to work with these people and to actually involve them. I think I think we're going to see a much looser arrangement in terms of HR structures than we've we've perhaps been used to. I absolutely agree. Um, in fact, I couldn't agree with you more. We've been running um, Kaizen processes um, within the business, which are cross-functional. Um, I think it's. A, change of mindset for the HR department to actually be involved in those cross-functional environments. But there's also a piece of learning for the business who tend to look round and say, what are you doing here? You're HR. Aren't you processing people? Um, the enjoyment that you can get out of joining the, the group, hearing all the different aspects it is, is, is really good from a career development point of view, from, from a business interest point of view. The value that an HR individual can get out of it on a personal basis is great. But also, you take an individual who works in a department that is probably the only department, except maybe for finance, that has to deal with every single part of the business every day. You can't just turn away a piece of your business and say, we don't look after you. So if you put the combined heads of the HR department together, what you have is a holistic view of the business and with your business partners a finger on the pulse of each part of that business. If you then put HR into the lean sections or the Kaizen sections and you can show that HR has something to contribute to the business as, as a representative in the business, not just as an HR person, there's a massive two-way gain um, both in the education of, of the of the staff, but also in the understanding of the HR department that can only benefit the business in terms of what kind of support we can give and how we can be seen to be worthwhile and of value. Absolutely. I think, I think it's, a, you know, it, it, it's, a, um, it, it's a really exciting agenda, I think, for, for people in, in our function now. I think, you know, the as you as you say, you know that there, there are more and more um, you know, HR professionals who who are now working on some you know very exciting projects and and have got the respect of of their colleagues because of the the dimensions that they can bring to solving these sorts of problems and uh, you know so so from that point of view, it's, it's, I think it's a very rosy future for the importance of people management inside um, inside organisations. Thanks, Paul. Um, I'm going to open up the floor now for some questions. We've had lots coming in already, so um, I'll start with this one. Isn't big data just the latest big thing? Is it really going to deliver all that it promises? Um, Hazel, do you want to answer that one? I don't know if it will deliver everything that it promises, but I do know it's not going away. Um, children nowadays get to, don't get to the age of two without pressing some form of button on some form of technology. Um, in fact, my nephew regularly teaches me how to get things to work, and he's only seven. Um, so will it fulfill all the promise? Um, I think we have to wait and see. But from an HR point of view, it's not going to go away. The expectation of your population within the business 
is not going to get lower. It's only going to get higher. So it's incumbent upon HR to decide how to use that to the best of your ability to deliver the best value into your business at any point in time and just try and keep eyes and ears open as to how we can move that forward, what trends we should be keeping up with, and just to make sure that we don't get left behind. Thanks, Hazel. Uh, I've got another one here. Um, engagement is a two-way street. How can senior leaders demonstrate their engagement to their employees? Uh, Paul, do you want to have? Do you want to answer that one? Uh, it's a very, it's a, it's a very, it's a very important issue, isn't it? And I think it goes back to you know, this question. That I, I use that uh, language that. Uh, that the Engage for Success movement would use, which is uh, you know, being able to convey a, a uh, um, strategic narrative. And I think, in, I think there are two things. You know, employees would judge, would, they, they, would, they would judge their leaders, of course, on you know, the, kind of, uh, the ethics of their own behavior, the values that they, that they demonstrate. And so we see um, you know, lots of organizations in thinking about this question of engagement giving renewed attention to their leadership models, to, to, to values and so on. But I think also, um, you know, it's this, uh, it's this kind of sense-making and sense-giving distinction that people often use in, 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 in strategy parlance. And, you know, when you're facing, um, you know, changing times, high levels of uncertainty, um, you know, lots of background issues, and we've been talking about many of these throughout this, 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 uh, this session, um, you know, employees look to to their leaders to be able to kind of find, help them find a path through that to kind of find uh, and, and to find, you know, um, things that are useful and meaningful. And, you know, so leaders, of course, have to be much more aware of, in a way, the, the different buttons that you have to push for, uh, you know, all members of your team, um, because it's, it's different things will engage different people. And, uh, you know, that ability is is going to become um, um, more and more important. So, you know, we're going to this will put a lot of um, um, pressure on our leaders because we need, you know, increasingly people actually jobs are becoming more and more technical. So people actually have to have deeper knowledge, more technical knowledge, um, and they also have to be very good people managers at the same time. And there's no longer an either or um, option. Uh, you have to do both. Okay, thanks, Paul. Um, I think this is going to have to be the last question. Um, how can companies attract and retain generations X and Y? Um, Hazel, do you want to answer that one? I think you have to first of all key into what genera generation X and Y are looking for. Um, I think what we referred to earlier about the, um, the social aspects of what people are looking for, the expectation and the 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 basis upon which they want their lives to go forward. Um, different industries, different businesses will be able to respond in different ways, but just understanding that it's no longer acceptable to dish out the norm and that you really need to listen to the people who you're trying to attract and understand what they are expecting and what they are looking for and find a way in your business to be able to respond to that. Thanks, Hazel, and thanks everyone for sending through your questions. If we haven't had time to answer yours, we will do so by email over the next few days. So thanks everyone for attending today. Uh, for those of you attending live, you will be sent a copy of the book Leading HR by Professor Paul Sparrow and of the ADP white paper this webinar has been based on. Thanks again to Hazel and Paul for your time today and for the interesting discussion. This webinar recording will be available on the events page of our website if you would like to view it again or would like to recommend it to any of your colleagues. Please visit the events page of our website for information about past and future ADP webinars, and we look forward to welcoming you to our next event. So until then, goodbye.